We now move to listed questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I call Lord Morrill. Question number one, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, Ken River pollution can be caused by a range of sources, including farms, sewage, industry, and domestic. My remit covers farm source pollution, and my department works with other departments and agencies on a range of measures to prevent pollution and to improve water quality. DARD and DOE are jointly responsible for implementation of the EU Nitrates Directive. The directive is implemented across the North by an action programme of measures which was first introduced in 2007. The purpose is to prevent water pollution from agricultural sources and to ensure that the manures and chemical fertilisers are used efficiently. The current Nitrates Action Programme for 2015-18 was agreed by the Executive in November 2014. My department also works in close partnership with DOE, other departments and stakeholders on the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. This EU directive aims to deliver long-term sustainability for the water environment and covers all sectors which have an impact on water. Implementation is through river basin management plans which have been agreed by the Executive. My department has also worked with a number of other departments on a long-term water strategy for the north of Ireland. This strategy is cross-cut and I expect it to come to the Executive for agreement in the coming months. River pollution is an issue which requires ongoing action. My department has demonstrated that it is working in a joined-up way to address farm source pollution and improve water quality. Could Lord Morrow for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Principal W. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister further in relation to that matter? It's obvious that there is no one area or no one sector of industry that is the culprit here. And she said that uh, she is doing her department are doing things to ensure that this matter is tackled. Does the Minister not agree with me that it is time for new initiatives around this whole issue to ensure that there is some collective responsibility and that the matter is tackled in a very direct way, which seems to be not the case at present? I, mean, I agree that partnership working is key in terms of um, all the different sources that there may be pollution, uh, why pollution may um, occur. From my department's um, remit, what I've set out clearly is where our responsibility lies. But we have worked collectively and cooperatively with other departments, particularly in relation to the Nitrates Programme and the Water Framework Directive. Rivers Agency obviously work with um, a range of other departments and councils, just in terms of joined up working there too. So where there's room to improve, I'm always open to, open to that. And if the members have any ideas they want to bring forward, other initiatives which we're not actively involved with, I'm very ha happy to, to take those suggestions on board. As I said, there's quite a range of ongoing activity with other departments, with councils and, and as I said, Rivers Agency staff. And I think that um, collectively that uh, we can continue to work together to, to make sure that we um, target people who are deliberately polluting um, water courses and causing all sorts of problems. But I think, as I said, there very much needs to be a cross-departmental approach to this. Call Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I thank the Minister for, uh, for her answers? Can the Minister tell us what action has, has been taken to assist farmers' compliance with the regulations? Yes, a range of guidance documents which assist farmers to comply with the Nitrates Action Programme and other EU environmental regulations have been produced by DARD and by DOE and have been distributed out to farmers. CAFRI provides an ongoing performance of training workshop, programme of um, training workshops for farmers. These include coverage of the Nitrates Action Programme and farm waste. The workshops are open to all farmers. In addition, a series of online support tools are available to help farmers comply with the requirements of the Nitrates Action Plan regulations. These cover nitrogen loading, nitrogen uh, or nutrient management and manure storage calculators. DART also provides a code of good agricultural practice for the prevention of, water, of pollution of water, air and soil. The code gives practical guidance for farmers in relation to pollution control. It also serves as a reference document for those involved in providing pollution control advice to farmers. The DARD Farm Advisory Service newsletter is published, by, published biannually and is issued to all farmers. This includes key advisory messages relating to the Nitrates Action Programme and the Water Framework Directive. My department also regularly um, issues advisory press articles on manure management and water quality. Well, Mr. Karen McCarthy. Uh, I welcome the Minister's response. Uh, river pollution or any pollution of our environment must never be tolerated. Will the Minister join with the Alliance Party, who has been calling for years for an independent environmental agency, so that that can be introduced so that we can overcome these problems once and for all? I am aware that um, the Environment Agency obviously comes under the remit of the Department of the Environment and they are out to consultation actually or are about to go out to consultation in relation to that and I think that there will be an opportunity for us all to consider the, way for, the best way forward on the basis on the background or the, the information that is provided as part of that consultation process. I call Ms Rosie McCorley. Uh, 
Kestedor, question two, please. I am pleased to advise that I propose to introduce the Rural Needs Bill, which was previously referred to as the Rural Proofing Bill, to the Assembly on the 9th of November of this year. This bill is designed to promote a fair and inclusive rural society by introducing a duty on government and local councils to consider the needs of our rural dwellers when developing policies and delivering public services. I will be working hard to ensure that this new legislation can complete its passage within the current Assembly mandate. Ms. McCauley for her supplementary. Um, can I ask the, uh, thank the Minister for her answer and can I ask uh, the Minister uh, what powers and provisions will the Rural Needs Bill contain? The Bill is aimed at ensuring um, the fair and equitable treatment of rural communities in the policy making process. It is going to build upon the existing arrangements, for example, through placing the executive the executive's existing commitment on a statutory footing and improving promotion and monitoring of rural proofing. It is proposed the bill will contain the following provisions in line with the final policy proposals agreed by the executive, and that is the introduction of a statutory duty in government departments and councils to consider the needs of people living in rural areas when developing new policies, strategies and plans, or when they are revising existing ones, and when designing and delivering public services or making changes to the way in which they are delivered. The power to make regulations to extend the bill to non-departmental public bodies, as may be specified in such regulations. The power for DAR to support rural proofing and the implementation of the bill through the provision of training, advice and guidance. A requirement for DAR to produce regular monitoring reports to be laid before the Assembly. DAR would seek and collate information from all departments on how they have considered the social and economic needs of people living in rural areas. And the provision for departments and councils to make arrangements for cooperation and collaboration to help ensure a more consistent and cohesive approach to addressing the needs of rural dwellers. Call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that update. Can the Minister give her assessment uh, of the legislative proposals from the Department of the Environment with regard to newly qualified young drivers and the restriction of uh, carrying passengers and the assertion that the proposal did not need to be rural proofed? What is the Minister's position on that? The reason that I'm bringing forward the legislation is because I believe that all proposals, all strategies, all policies, all decisions taken at um, both central government and local government level need to be rural proofed. I think the member, um, like myself, represents a rural constituency and we know the challenges there are, particularly for young people who perhaps have employment, where they could be working to maybe 11 o'clock at night and trying to get home, public transport not being readily available. So there are particularly challenges um, that are there that are posed as a result of the DOE legislation that's, that's been put on the table. So I think that um, the, the reason that I'm bringing forward this legislation is to, in fact, protect against those um, decisions being taken in the future without giving due consideration to the needs of rural people. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Principal Deputy Speaker, what discussion has Minister have you had with other members of the executive to improve decision making with the other departments in terms of rural proofing? I'm thinking here particularly, of a, uh, for example, around residential homes and when I look at the consultations so on, I see little emphasis on the rural proofing aspect. Again, this is why I think we need to have the legislation. I think that um, people, the public, the rural dwellers need to be confident that when decisions are being taken by decision makers, uh, in government that their, their needs are being obviously reflected in, in those decisions and those policy decisions that are being taken. Um, I'm concerned that um, to date, whilst rural proofing has been in place for quite a number of years, it hasn't been consistent, it hasn't been applied across the board, and some departments are better than others uh, in terms of actually making sure that it happens. So I think that th this legislation is going to strengthen that. It's going to clearly put on record whenever I lay a report um, each year in front of the Assembly, we'll be able to see at first hand how departments have actively engaged and how they actively have um, rural proofed the policy decisions. So that's going to lead to improvements, I believe, in the longer term for rural dwellers. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Number three. A full equality impact assessment of the Rural Development Programme 2014 to 20 was carried out in 2013. This included a 16 week public consultation period. This equality assessment was finalised as part of the submission of the Rural Development Programme and associated documents to the EU Commission on the 14th of October 2014 and is available on the DARD website. Our aim is to ensure a quality of opportunity for all applicants to the RDP. The distribution of funds will depend on the number and the quality of eligible applications and how they best fit the objectives of the respective schemes. For land-based schemes such as ANC, areas of natural constraint funding, will depend on the nature and the type of the land. The EQIA set out a number of mitigating actions to ensure a quality of opportunity for potential beneficiaries. These were structured around each of the Section 75 groups examined as part of the EQIA. An Equality Action Plan has been drafted which has aligned the EQIA mitigating recommendations against key areas of programme implementation. 
An action plan will be updated biannually in advance of the programme um, monitoring committee on the actions that have been taken for each process. This should help to ensure that the mitigating actions recommended in the EQIA are considered during further programme development and implementation. Mr Campbell for supplementary. Well, the Minister has outlined the uh, EQIA process, but is she aware that, for example, in the Causeway Coast and Glens area, where the local action group uh, delivers rural, rural development programme funding, that the councillor makeup is broadly reflective of the political religious breakdown, but the social partners are not, given that 80 per cent of the social partners are, are from the nationalist community in an area that's probably 75 per cent unionist. Will she ensure that consideration is given to community background when ascertaining in the future the composition of local action groups because delivery of funding flows from that? The member will, will be, I'm sure, aware of the leader approach, which is very much a bottom-up approach. So the people that came forward for the lags, the, the, the on the ground were, came from the grassroots, it came from the community, it's those people that came forward. Obviously we want things to be reflective, but for, for me what's most important in the Rural Development Programme is that we get that funding out, that we deliver for projects for rural people as a whole, it doesn't matter what background you have. I think that um, the, the lag that, um, that you refer to, I, I can't um, comment specifically on the makeup of that lag, but I can say that I know that every effort, every effort was made to make sure that the groups were as inclusive as possible, that we looked towards groups that were underrepresented. And I'm delighted that this time round we have more women, we have more young people, which was something we didn't have in the previous programme. So there has been very much a positive sea change in terms of the membership of the group. But the, as I said, it's very much a grassroots up approach. The people came from the community, they were chosen by the local area group, and I think that is reflective of the people that came forward. But obviously we want all our groups to be inclusive. We want to make sure that the people that are making the decisions are reflective of, of community. And that, I think that is the case in, in all the lags that have been, come, uh, been appointed to date. Call Mr John Dowlett. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the uh, Minister for her answer and pay tribute to the Rural Development Programme for the work that they have done. Would the Minister agree with me that the needs and the aspirations of the rural community are far greater than being described in a sectarian headcount, and which you outlined how the business communities, Protestant and Catholic, if we have to use those terms, will benefit from the Rural Development Programme between now and 2020. Yes, and I very much concur with um, what the member has, has said. Um, I think what's most important is that we spend every single penny of this European funds to the best effect for rural communities as a whole. And I look forward to being able to open a number of the schemes over the, no the next number of months. Particularly, I mean, this is the largest ever rural development programme that we've ever had in the north of Ireland, up to £623 million pounds of funding. £250 million of that for a farm business improvement scheme. We've got the Rural Business Investment Scheme, which is going to open up very shortly. We have tourism measures. We have um, community, obviously, basic services and communities. There's such a range of um, fantastic schemes that are coming um, online over the next number of months. My priority has been to work with the LAGs to make sure that they sign off on their strategies, which we hope to have completed by the end of the year, so then we can very quickly see the spend. And I absolutely agree with you in terms of what's most important in this programme is that we get the spend out there and we help rural communities in their entirety, regardless of what their, their background may be. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Minister, would you agree with me that the most important aspect of this programme is to ensure that those who are entitled to receive the funds are those that receive the, so the funds and not some form of sectarian headcount as has been produced in the question? In fact, do you not find the question offensive and counter to any building a united community strategy of the executive? I do, I do agree with you, and as, as I said, I think what's most important here is that we spend every single penny of this to the best effect to enhance rural communities, to enhance rural businesses, to look, to af or look after our environment and look after our farmers. Call Mr Jim Ballister. Under the uh, previous programme, several million pounds, it turns out, were siphoned off to sporting bodies, most particularly and most generously to the GAA, with Tyrone GAA told, said to be one of the richest, getting almost a million pounds. Given the crisis in frontline farming, what assurance is there this time that rural funding will actually go to meet those frontline and essential needs rather than being squandered as previously? I think the, the member would, should be careful with his language. There's no siphoning off of any funds from the Rural Development Programme. Anybody who received funding through the Rural Development Programme did so because they were assessed by a panel who decided that their application was eligible. All funds were spent to the best effect for rural communities right across all the measures which I've already set out. And um, a number of sporting organisations were also avail are able to benefit from the programme, which is right and proper. 
The GEA, like any other organisation, is at the heart of a rural community, and why shouldn't they be able to benefit if the project that they are providing is for the wider community benefit? And in the cases that um, have been assist assisted with finance, it is because the local action group, which is made up of political representatives and community sector um, individuals that have come forward, who have took decisions and used the, the fund on which they have been allocated to the best effect, they have decided that within the, within the rules of the programme, they have decided within the rules of the programme that those funding applications are eligible, and they funded them accordingly. Call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, question number four. Following considerable public interest in the enforcement of the Welfare of Animals Act 2011, the Assembly agreed a private member's motion in March 2014, which called for a review of the implementation of the 2011 Act, particularly sentencing guidelines and practices. The purpose of the review is to ensure that animal welfare enforcement is dealt with effectively. The Department published an interim report of the review in um, February 2015, which recommended increasing the maximum sentences on, and fine on conviction for the more serious summary offences, and increasing the maximum prison term in the case of indi indictable offences. This will mean that the penalties for animal welfare offences here are tough or tougher than any that are available in the 26 counties or in Britain. There was a, um, substantial support for this recommendation during the consultation on the interim report. Primary legislation is needed to amend the 2011 Act to implement this recommendation. DAR does not have any suitable primary legislation available within this mandate. However, the high level of public support for this recommendation, um, given the high level of, of public support for the recommendation, I wanted to implement it quickly. I therefore wrote to the Justice Minister in July to request that he consider amending the maximum sentences in the 2011 Act through the Justice No. 2 Bill. This bill deals with, among other things, fine collection and prison services. The Justice Minister is content to include the necessary provisions in the Justice No. 2 Bill, and my officials are currently working um, with officials in his department to progress the Bill. It is anticipated that the Bill will be scrutinised by both the Agriculture and Rural Development and the Justice Committees in November, and I trust you will support the amendments to increase the sentences and fines in, in the Welfare of Animals Act when the Justice No. 2 Bill comes before the Assembly. Mr. Clark, for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answer to my question? And, and indeed, I do welcome the comments in that. And I'm sure the, the, the Minister will be familiar with, or all too familiar with the case in my constituency, where a member of the public let their dog hang on the ropes of, of, of their, their curtains to die, and indeed was given a very lenient sentence. And I think because of that, the public got behind that. So, in, in, your, in your, your response, Minister, you did say about coming towards the end of the mandate. Will there be a possibility that this can be um, expedited as quick as possible, so as we can get this brought in, uh, in case there is fear uh, from the community in terms of other people or individuals who looked after animals in such an appalling way of this lady did in Antrim? Well, obviously, I condemn all acts of animal cruelty, and I think um, that was very much reflected in the public consultation that we received to the interim report, which, which we consulted on. Um, absolutely, in terms of time scale, the Justice Minister is committed to taking the, his justice. Um, Bill number two through the, through the Assembly in this mandate, and obviously my officials are working with them to make sure that we have the proposed changes to sentencing included within that bill. Call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Margaret, uh, can I thank the Minister for her response to the member's question? And can the Minister further clarify at this point what uh, the proposed changes, changes to sentencing will entail? Margaret. The interim report of the review of the Welfare of Animals Act um, recommended that DARD consider increasing the maximum sentences as follows. So, summary offences increased the maximum prison sentence available for those found guilty of the more serious summary offences from six months up to 12 months, and the maximum fine go from 5,000 to 20,000. Indictable offences in increased the maximum prison sentence for those found guilty on indictment from two years to five years. The maximum unlimited fine would remain unchanged. So, I propose to amend certain offences, including breaching a disqualification order, selling or partnering with an animal painting on the outcome of an appeal to a deprivation order, and offences relating to images of animal fighting, so they become a hybrid offences. In the case of unnecessary suffering and animal fighting, which are already hybrid offences, I propose to increase the current penalties on summary conviction to 12 months and/or a fine of £20,000. This will give effect to the recommendation from the review, as these represent the most serious offences under the 2011 Act, and it is appropriate that the penalties available to Magistrate Court reflect this. Call Mr. Chris Lowe. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome uh, the announcement today, and I, I ask the Minister would she agree that this is at least one example of two executive ministers, uh, herself and the Minister for Justice, working together to respond to an issue of serious public concern. Uh, in increasing the maximum sentence for serious offences uh, to five years, and what other uh, provisions the review of the Welfare of Animals Act might bring forward? 
I, mean, I very much welcome the partnership approach that we've taken. Um, obviously, the Justice Minister was in a position to bring forward a bill that could encompass the changes that we wanted to make, so it's um, worked out very well for us in terms of being able to respond to the public concern that was obviously there, the public angst, and we're able to respond to it in a very speedy manner. In terms of the wider review, we've consulted on the interim report, and obviously officials are working on um, the group that was put forward to, to, to initiate the review are actually working their way through the final report and we hope to have that over the next number of months. But there are um, practical things that we can be doing on an ongoing basis which um, officials are actually working their way through. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. The 2014-2020 Rural Development Programme will make a range of capital support measures available to farmers. These include the Business Investment Scheme, the European Innovation Partnership, operational groups and innovation demonstration scheme, which are all part of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, as well as farm diversification support under the Leader Programme and capital support for agri-environment agreement holders. With the Rural Development Programme now approved by the European Commission, my officials are working, continuing to work hard to secure the relevant business case approvals and to make the necessary arrangements in order to open the schemes in a phased way. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme will be a cornerstone of the new RDP and will be a package of measures aimed at knowledge transfer, cooperation, innovation, as well as capital investment which will help support sustainable growth in the sector. The first phase of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which comprises the knowledge transfer schemes, will start with the launch of the business development groups for farmers. The first phase is intended to help farmers to clearly identify their needs ahead of any capital investment and to make informed decisions about developing their businesses. The other um, farm business improvement schemes will follow in a coordinated manner, including the proposed capital programme that is planned for next year. The knowledge transfer element of the farm business improvement scheme will open in November, in preparation for the majority of capital schemes to open in 2016. Well, Mr. Eastwood, for supplementary. Thank the minister for, for her answer. Can I just ask her: Is, is there a pre preliminary plan uh, that her department has in place to deal with these monies? Well, the main plan is that we get the, the, the programmes opened as quickly as possible. The first um, programme we'll see opened um, will be the Farm Business Improvement Scheme and the development groups, and that's going to open very shortly. And I think that um, that allows us to actually work with farmers around what are their, helping them to identify their business plan and what are their practical needs. Alongside of that, then, as I said, all the capital programmes we expect to come on stream next year, which include the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which include um, the Rural Business Investment Scheme, which in include the spend with the lags. So there's it's quite an exciting time for rural development and being able to get all those schemes opened. Um, officials have been working very hard to make sure that we do that as quickly as possible. Call Mr Ian Mill. Uh, last one, Paul Yard. Um, August Mulwakas, Don Eyre, Gautier Shaw. Thank you, our Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her uh, answers thus far. Um, has the, your department been engaged in any preparatory work, uh, like the last member has asked, with farmers in anticipation of uh, opening of other schemes? Or any scheme. Yeah, as I said, the, the plans to roll out the farm business um, scheme in, in a, and it's going to come forward in a proposed in a, in a, a phased way. And the early focus is going to be about making advice and support available to farmers through the knowledge transfer measures. And that first phase, as I said, is going to open very. It's actually going to open next Monday. Um, for, so that would be a business development groups for farmers to come along to, to discuss with officials to help them work through what are their business needs and then what are the opportunities for them to actually come forward for capital grants whenever they come online. Um, in the certainly that's the first quarter of next year. I think that um, I encourage all farmers to actually get involved in the business development groups because they're going to help farmers improve their knowledge of business management. They're going to help them around looking towards new technologies and innovative ways of working. Um, alongside that, DARD's also planning to deliver farm um, family key skills training schemes, including farm safety and business planning. And I think, as I said, these early measures will help farmers to think very carefully about their business plans before they make any decisions about capital um, investment. As I said, the other farm business improvement schemes will follow in a coordinated manner, including the business investment scheme and um, the capital programme that's planned for next year. And any farmer that's considering making a capital investment may wish to start now thinking about anything they would need to do in advance, such as considering the implication for planning legislation, health and safety legislation. With regard to construction, farmers should be familiarising themselves with the relevant legislation that already applies to the construction of farm businesses, and that will include the Construction Regulations 2007. Farmers may also want to consider checking the performance of their farm business through benchmarking, and if anybody wants to get involved with that, they can contact, CAF, uh, contact CAFRI and they'll certainly help them with that regard. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson. 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, given the interest from farmers, it was concerning to me the lack of detail forthcoming from officials presenting to the Agricultural Committee recently. There can be little doubt that the capital grant scheme will be of the most interest to the sector. So, can the Minister detail some of the specific points identified in this year's whole farm needs assessment? Yes, I mean, I know the officials were up in front of the committee um, last week, and I know that um, there was quite a a detailed engagement in terms of going forward. Obviously, we have such a high number of schemes that we're trying to develop and trying to get business plans um, passed, and we've been working our way actually through that. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme and the Capital Grant Scheme, I think, is, is absolutely the scheme that pe most pe farmers are looking towards. Is capital investment is something that's going to help them to invest, to be more efficient and more productive in the future. That's not going to come on stream to next year, which is why there isn't the detail out there in terms of the actual um, scheme details. But that will be forthcoming in a very appropriate and timely manner. What I am doing now is I'm encouraging farmers to actually get involved in the business development groups because very much what we've done is set this out in a phased approach, firstly around um, working with farmers on a practical basis around identifying their needs, developing business plans. Then it's about knowledge transfer and, and that exchange, working with CAFRI advisors. And then the third phase of that would be the actual capital grant scheme. So as information becomes available, we certainly will be providing that. We're not going to leave anybody in the dark. I want to make sure that um, farmers avail of the scheme when, when it becomes uh, available in the early part of next year. In terms of the farm needs assessment, um, the member will be aware the department carried out that assessment to improve the design of the farm business improvement scheme. We, were, um, we received over 2,500 responses, so that was um, very positive in terms of farmers actually wanting to be part of um, the, the process that comes forward. And I very much welcome the fact that um, that was an important element for us to um, be able to, to design the scheme and make it forward. So there's no attempt to hold back information. Farmers will have it as soon as I have it to give them. But as I said in an earlier answer to um, Ian Millen, I said that the first phase, the business development scheme, will open next Monday. And that's something that's um, very positive, and I encourage all farmers um, to get involved in that first tranche of, of that scheme. Call Mr. Joe Barr. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. There are no plans to close AFB's OMA site, however, a number of efficiency measures will be implemented. AFB's 2020 strategy pose, proposed the centralisation of ancillary veterinary laboratory testing at its Stony um, Road site, which is located just outside the Stormont Estate. This proposal would enable a modest reduction to the staffing requirements at AFB's laboratory facilities in OMA while making the existing range and geographic coverage of disease diagnostic services to the local livestock industry. AFB proposes to move the preparation of microscopic slides of animal tissues to Stony Road and return the slides to OMA for examination and reporting. It will also centralise all um, parasitological examination work at Stony Road. This will produce savings while continuing to provide laboratory services to livestock owners and vets from the OMA facility. As these are internal AFB efficiency measures, I had no reason to um, raise any concerns, and as such, I accepted AFB's proposal for how it manages the services it delivers from the OMA site. Call Mr. Byrne for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister recognise, however, that it is very important for the farming community in the counties of Derry, Tyrone, and Fermanagh that we have the post mortem service that is carried out on animals, be they cattle, sheep, pigs, or, or hens? And would she recognise that it is important that enough investment is retained there to make sure that we have a viable service going forward. Yes, as I said, as part of the AFB's decisions on, on terms of its way forward, I'm, I'm glad that they have actually decided to um, whilst make some modest savings at the OMA um, plant, but they are going to continue to provide the laboratory services there that will assist obviously livestock owners and vets from, from the OMA facility for all the areas that, that you've referred to. Call Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, Could the Minister outline her vision for the future of the AFP estate? Well, work is ongoing with AFP to establish the future of the AFP estate based on their strategic vision and scientific priorities. Um, AFP's 2020 strategy contains AFP's cost of proposals to address its budget pressures for the year ahead and for the rest of the decade, including proposals that are relevant to the future consolidation and rationalisation of AFP's estate. As I said, DFP's um, we've initial outline business case for the capital investment required to uh, relocate AFB's headquarters facilities from Newforge and to consider the future of the lock-off facilities being prepared and has been refined further to incorporate feedback from DFP and in the context of AFB's 2020 strategy. A master plan for the farm buildings of the AFB Hillsborough estate has been developed and is envisaged that there will be a consolidation, replacement and modernisation programme 
um, thing. But I think, um, suffice to say, that AFP has very much uh, taken a look at uh, how it conducts its work. It's very much developed a strategy which is shrink to grow. And I think that um, we can work collectively with them in terms of making sure that we have a very strong scientific base going into the future, which will assist and work with the industry and identify very much with the industry and identify their needs and what research that they need. Time is up. That brings us to the end of listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what discussions she's had with the large retailers, given the unfairness which still exists within the supply chain and where the farmer has been squeezed? I, mean, I totally agree with you in terms of the supply chain, and there's a need for furnace in the supply chain. The member will know that I have consistently raised that point, and from the inception of going for growth strategy, um, at the corner, uh, the centre of that is the fact that there needs to be recognition of that one supply chain, and everybody along that supply chain needs to enjoy the risks and the benefits that comes from that, that more joined up approach. I actually hosted the first supply chain forum over the last number of weeks, which saw um, representatives from right across the industry, including the major retailers, to discuss actually how we can start to build trust, repair. Um, relationships that have absolutely broken down in the past and how we can collectively work together. Um, I'm going to continue to drive forward that piece of work because I think it, it is absolutely key. I regularly meet with um, the major retailers and I regularly make the point that if they want to have um, a fantastic first class product, which our farmers obviously um, produce, if they want to continue to have that into the future, then they need to make sure that our farmers receive a fair price for the product that they receive. Mr Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the actions that the Minister has been taking, but uh, to date, uh, we don't really see much on the ground for the supplier at the farm gate. So, can the Minister advise today what comfort we can give to the farming community from this House that action has been taken that's going to see their price at the farm gate come to a proper level that's going to make it sustainable for them? Well, the members are very aware that um, pricing is something that is outside the control of government. However, we can, within government, do the take forward the initiatives which I have already set out that we are actively involved with. Farmers can be in under um, no doubt that, in terms of my role, my role is to champion the needs of the farmer, and that is very much what I bring to any conversation which I have with the retailers. But if we do not correct the supply chain problem, farmers are going to be the ones that are continually pushed in terms of the price that they receive. So that is why we need to have this um, sea change in terms of attitudes right across the whole su supply chain. That if we could maybe have a, a fresh new way to look at actually how supply chain works, how that um, ongoing um, communication works right across the supply chain, then perhaps we can see changes further down the line for, for the farming industry. But certainly, I make sure that I raise the point. I am very passionate about raising that point. And I believe that going for growth as a strategy is only successful if there is that furnace in the supply chain. Call Ms. Clare Hanna. Mr Speaker, um, the Minister will be aware of um, uh, last month the removal of a lot of gravel from uh, the be bed of the River Lagan at Lady Dixon in South Belfast and the impact that's had on salmon spawning there and the risk of increased winter flooding. Um, can you advise whether uh, Dard and the Rivers Agency have restored that river bed or reimbursed the Lagan Canal Trust for the cost of it? Yeah, I mean, I don't believe that um, Rivers Agency ha have a need to re reimburse. However, um, I don't have all the detail of that um, scenario. However, I do uh, remember uh, having a conversation with the Rivers Agency about it last week. There was very much it was a partnership approach. It was the council and others involved in terms of the project. But Rivers Agency certainly didn't feel that they were at fault. But I'll, I'll happy to um, write to the member just with more details around what actually is the next steps. Because obviously, we don't want to interfere with the spawning of salmon and make sure that um, that, that um, process is ongoing. For a well, I think just on the back of that, I think um, the angling clubs are concerned that there's a miscommunication between DARD and DECAL uh, and with angling clubs. And could the minister um, suggest what mechanisms might be put in place to uh, address that that communications imbalance? Well, obviously, um, inland fisheries is the responsibility of DECAL. However, in this instance, the Rivers Agency were involved with the work on the lag on the bank. So. Um, I am very open to conversation with the decal minister if there is a need for, for that to happen. I do know that we took some action last week in relation to on, the, on the back of, of what happened. I know it was approached by um, some local media also who had uh, raised the issue in, in, in with me. So um, there will be no, we'll not be found wanting in terms of working together if that's what's needed to make sure we correct the problem. Well, Mr. Raymond McCartney. I'm going to the last concluder. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And mindful of, of our questions has been asked today of the Minister in, in particular around issues that affect farming communities, would the Minister outline the extent of the collaborative work that takes across between and among farmers right across the island of Ireland? 
Yeah, um, obviously there's quite a range of um, areas where we work together collectively and, and we deal with a lot of these issues on, at NSMC meetings, but even outside of that, um, we, we continually uh, address quite a number of issues, and particularly um, around CAP, around mapping exercises and ANC designation. We've been working together on the development of the All Island Animal Health and Welfare Strategy, Plant Health Strategy, LOCKS Agency, Country of Origin Labelling, um, Fish Diseases, Fisheries, Research and Development Cooperation, um, the Equine Industry, Pillar 2 Knowledge Transfer Groups, the All Island Rural Innovation Awards, Forest Service, um, Veterinary Medicines, Agricultural Emissions, um, Multi Agency Livestock Crime Liaison, and Legislation and Enforcement Issues. So there's quite a range of issues that, um, that are taken forward on an ongoing daily basis at, at official level, but then also between myself and Minister Coveney. Mr. McCartney, for a supplementary. I've got to prove last week, I've got to break a slash and error, Don Fragerson. Thank you very much, Principal. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer and indeed a number and very co comprehensive range of issues which obviously have been of benefit to the farming and rural communities. Uh, would the Minister take this opportunity perhaps to give us an update particularly on the issue around labelling and how in particular that has helped farmers right across the island? Yes, um, I'm pretty concerned in relation to the label issue and have been for, for quite some time and I've continually raised, raised this issue at European level but also with Minister Coveney. When I last met him on the 2nd of July, he indicated that he was going to also liaise with the Commissioner regarding terms on labels that um, would be deemed acceptable and explore the use of a, an Island of Ireland label um, and subsequently issue guidelines to the industry. I have since written to the Minister again seeking an update on progress and additional voluntary labelling um, packaging for, for meat and I will keep the member informed on any progress. I think it's important that we do resolve this issue because um, it affected um, the lamb sector earlier this year, it affected beef last year. It will have a trickle down effect on all other sectors. So I think that if we're able to address the issue of a voluntary label with perhaps the wording that would say um, product of the island of Ireland, then that allows us to be able to continue the, the traditional trade which we have on the island and also it allows us to look towards new markets collectively together. Call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to basic farm payment cross compliance uh, land inspections, uh, what is the Department's time frame for assessment of these inspections by the local office? I don't have any specific time frame with me, but um, suffice to say that we're obviously trying to meet our targets and get the maximum number paid in December. That's what we're working towards. Inspections are ongoing, and as soon as those inspection findings are received, the, the intention is to turn them around as quickly as possible. As I said, I want to make sure that we pay the maximum number of people in that first payment um, batch that goes out in the first week of December. Mr. Arwin, first supplementary. <coughs> uh, I just received information today that there were June inspections that have taken place, land inspections that are not yet assessed five months later. Does the Minister believe that this is a timely time frame? Well, I have no indication or no information to suggest that that is the case, but if you want to pick it up with me outside of question time, that's not a problem. Call Ms. Rosie McCorley. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, can she outline what cross-border opportunities will be developed uh, through the rollout of the new Rural Development Programme? The leader scheme of the new Rural Development Programme, which will be delivered by, my, um, newly, uh, by the newly uh, formed Local Action Group, contains a 7 per cent focus on cross-border cooperation. My department will be working closely with the new LAGs to develop cross-border projects which may focus on tourism, recreational and the development of social enterprises. Can I ask the Minister, um, will each um, lag be compelled to uh, develop uh, cross-border projects? Yes, it is mandatory for each lag to develop at least two cross-border projects. A uh, joint North-South conference has been proposed for January that is going to assist lags to help them really to establish the partnerships, to um, share ideas and then to look at best practice and hopefully then allow them to be able to identify worthy, worthwhile projects which they can take forward within each of their respective lags. Call Mr Stephen Moutry. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how many basic farm payment land inspections that our department has carried out via both classical and remote sensing this year? I don't have those figures on me, but I'm happy to provide the member. But um, you'll know that each year we've been ramping up the number of remote controlled sensing inspections. Um, perhaps, perhaps this year we're up to two and a half thousand, but I, I need to confirm that with you in writing. Call Mr. Moutry for thank you. The, the, the minister, and I thank the minister for answering. She indicated that she wants to uh, increase the number of remote controlled sensing. Can I ask what methods you're using to promote that and to do that? 
Well, that's really an internal measure for the department to actually go out and do our, our, our um, inspections by remote control sense. And obviously, it's important that we get the, the digital or th there's a word for it, but the photography right to make sure we do all those things right. But I, the, the benefits for us being able to um, increase the number year on year has meant that we're able to get more people paid their payment in the first batch in December. So this year, obviously, we'll be hoping to repeat that, that experience. But um, we should get to the stage eventually where we have all inspections done by remote sensing, and that will really help and speed everything up. Call Mr. Sean Lynch. Good, uh, pre Kolya. What are the Minister's future intentions for the ANC scheme? As part of the decisions on cap reform in June 2014, I announced that a payment would be made to farmers in the SDA from the Rural Development um, Programme Pillar 2 under an ANC scheme. This would operate for two years in 2016 and 17, and then be reviewed thereafter. Work has just commenced to look at the future options for supporting these areas, and my intention is to advance a consultation by the 31st of March to enable the, any potential changes to the architecture of the CAP regime in the 2017-2020 um, period be notified to the EU Commission before its deadline of the 1st of um, August 2016. Mr. Lynch for um, and I want to thank the Minister for our answer. What was the value of ANC payments in this year? The um, most recent payments, which were made in March of this year, equated to £23.81 per hectare for disadvantaged areas on common land and £47.62 per hectare for severely disadvantaged areas. Mr. Chris Hazard is not in his place. Mr. Paul Given is not in his place. I call Mr. Trevor Long. Uh, thank you. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister if she can give us an update on the the good health or otherwise of the horse muscle beds in Strangford Lock. Uh, well, the member will know that um, my officials met with the Commission and informally accepted a number of actions which the Commission felt were necessary to obviously maintain and uh, deal with our responsibilities under the Habitats Directive. He will know that um, the Commission um, were content with the scheme that we put forward and that um, things have been run very smoothly. Um, obviously, it's continually reviewed. But the Commission has now formally advised us that, um, as a result of the progress being made, that they are, they are content. The um, Strangford Log Fishing Licences are reviewed and awarded annually with the aim of establishing an environmentally and economically sustainable fishery within the lock. So, obviously, the health of the horse muscle is, is key to all of that. So, um, I can tell him it's a very positive picture. Call Mr. Lund for supplementary. Yes, I thank the Minister for that answer. She's, she's uh, attributing a great deal of knowledge to me that I don't have because I'm not on the Agriculture Committee. But uh, the, the last time I asked about this, we were talking about horse muscle beds that were about the size of a, a table tennis table, and they should have been the size of a football pitch. So, I mean, when you talk about progress, and I know, as you say, the Commission appears to be moderately satisfied, but are we still at risk of infraction proceedings if that progress doesn't continue? Well, we're not at risk in that the Commission are content with the proposals that we've, proposals that we've put forward. Um, and when I say the picture is positive, the picture is more positive than what it was. We have a revised restoration plan in place, which is all about protecting the horse muscle into the future. We have fishery restrictions, uh, you'll remember, we're, or you may remember, were put in place at, <laughs> in Strangford Lock. So um, all the initiatives that are being taken are, are all about um, protecting the, um, the horse muscle, but also making sure that we live up to our obligations and that we are, in fact, not fined. So we don't believe that there's any intention from the Commission to fine us at this moment in time. That brings us to the end of topical questions to the Minister of Agricultural and Rural Development.